So I welcome on stage already our host for the panel, Stephanie Pilon, our panelist Andy Cavell, Christian Eckert, Andre Kempe, and Dora Nikalova. There she is. The topic is how to set up your marketing stack and what ad tech still needs to fix. Enjoy. Thanks, guys, for being here. Um, before we kick it off, though, why don't we go around and introduce ourselves, starting with you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dora, and I'm a growth marketing manager at a company called Here. Um, I'm working specifically for the app that is called Here We Go. Uh, Here We Go helps you uh, find your way in the city. Basically, you can compare uh, all kinds of transportation modes, be it public transportation or, or car sharing, uh, or simply driving with your car around the city. Uh, and I'm helping with App Store optimization, um, so helping converting users and bringing them to the store. Hi, my name is Andre. I'm working as a CMO of uh, free to move and we provide mobility in uh, metro areas like Berlin where you can use car sharing apps like DriveNow, Cardigo and so on in uh, one app and find the closest car next to you. Hey guys, my name is Christian and although I cannot see any of you guys, I'm happy to be here today. Um, I'm co-founder of a company called Customlytics um, and we actually do focus on the technical side of app marketing. Um, we don't build any proprietary own tool. We consult on what tools to use, how to connect them, how to set them up. Um, everything from tracking to analytics, CRM, all of that. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Andy. I gave a talk earlier, so maybe some of you saw me already. Um, Co-founder at Feature, we're a mobile growth consultancy based here in Berlin. Um, we work with companies to help them um, build a co cohesive and uh, holistic mobile growth strategy. Great. Now, I actually have been on a panel on the other side with Christian where he was the moderator. And I'm going to start this off with a bit of an icebreaker because I think it's quite a nice question. So what are your favorite apps or app at the moment? Okay, most used apps probably are uh, things like Messenger or WhatsApp. Um, favorite apps is um, or, or Google Maps actually. I use it quite often since I'm c completely lost in big cities usually. Um, we can use Here We Go. <laughs> <laughs> we help you with that. Yeah, apart from that, um, I actually do not have such a thing like a favorite app or something like that. I try everything I find out, but that's probably part of uh, being in that business? Um, I would say favorite app for every day is Here We Go. Um, mm -hmm. I know I work for Here We Go, but basically it's, uh, it's equally as good as Google <coughs> Maps, so um, try it on. Have awesome offline maps. Um, and another one that I actually really like small apps that just started, and one of the speakers today is the founder of one of them. I really like La La Lab. So really awesome idea. Um, and then, of course, very popular messengers of everything that's social. Um, I guess, like, every one of us, is, we're using that. Cool. Um, so let's take a step back. So if I was a, st was a startup, and I know that there's probably many, there's startups here, there's bigger companies here, it's, there's sort of like a whole mix range of size of companies or, or apps here, um, what would be the first thing that I'd need to sort out in terms of tech if I'm a startup? Very good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, although this is uh, probably not what you guys want to hear, but actually it's um, your product. Um, so, and this is also what, what um, some companies actually um, lose out on. Um, you have to get your product right in the first place. Um, and with product right, I don't mean bug free product because such thing doesn't exist. Um, I mean, get it to a state where you can actually, you know, market it in a way that it doesn't fuck up everything else. Um, so, for in terms of tech stack, what you need when you start up uh, as an app company is in the first place something to make sure your product is working. That is crash tracking, something like, I don't know, Crashlytics, uh, any of those. Um, crash tracking, performance tracking for your app. Um, and then as a second step, everything that goes with marketing. Is there anything that you put on the back burner? Like apart from what you're saying with marketing, is there anything else that you would think um, about later on in, in uh, your life cycle? Yes. Um, so from the, again, tech stack, I would say a CRM provider is something that 
makes perfect sense if you have reached at least a minimum amount of you know a critical mass of users that you can actually reach. But if you just start off with zero daily active users, then this is something that you can do after you fix you know your product and maybe install tracking and then maybe analytics. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah, I think CRM can definitely wait, as as Christian says, if if you don't have a certain like certain amount of users that you can reach, then you're really not going to get much benefit from push notifications or email campaigns. Um, so yeah, much better to start in the early days with getting a decent level of like basic measurement in place that you can actually see what's going on and see how your first users are interacting with the app, um, which means like some basic level of analytics. Like doesn't have to be tracking ev every single thing, but at least like the, the kind of key engagements and the key flows through the app <laughs> that you can really see are your products uh, is your product working? Are the features working? And, and how are users interacting with the product? If you can't measure it, you can't make it better. Um, yeah, just to add on something. For example, it's very important for uh, App Store, for the App Store optimization. Uh, many startups they underestimate the fact that if they push users to their new product, they're going to have very crappy reviews, and this will lead to, of course, much worse conversion rate. Uh, and, I, and I've seen it happening. So. I guess many of us we're being approached after meetups uh, or other events by startups, and they're saying, "Great, can can we use your service? Can you please give us an advice how to start with marketing?" And then exactly what the guy said: it's super important. Fix your product and make tests, really controlled tests, because at the beginning you won't be uh, really skyrocketing your uh, reviews. And if your reviews are really bad, that's a really horrible starter. It's difficult to, to, to compensate for, especially on Android, where ratings are accumulative. They're not erased like on iOS with every release cycle. So don't go in a rush with marketing. Fix your product first. Yeah. And when you are on this stage, do you think that you do need third-party tools like measurement tracking, like someone like Adjust? Or is it not necessary? Can you get by with just using different SDKs? Um, from my experience, maybe just quickly, um, because I was working with one startup, um, so we looked at different kind of solutions, and honestly, you need a tracking provider because you need to understand what's going on after the install. It's not enough just to know how many installs are there, but you have to understand what's going on afterwards, re-engage your user maybe, et cetera. And something very important, you cannot really count on consoles, such as iOS developer console, because it's an extrapolated data. It's based on only people that <coughs> opted in and agreed to share their data. So iOS estimates installs, estimates all kind of like values like that are very important. So for me, maybe the consultants can say more about it, but I think it's important to have a tracking provider. Now, I know a few of you up here have worked at startups and then worked at companies that grew from a startup to, I guess, a bigger enterprise, so to speak. How did you see that change? Like, how did your marketing stack change at that point when you did get bigger? Uh, I can, can answer that from, from my time at SoundCloud. I joined SoundCloud uh, back in 2012 um, and, and stayed with the team for the next four and a half, five years, something like that. Uh, I really saw the company grow a lot during that time. Um, I think, like, the way that SoundCloud matured, certainly in terms of the, the tech stack, was that they started to build out. First of all, they got they upgraded the analytics with third-party tools. Um, so they switched out a very kind of web-centric um, analytics provider with with um, we got something much more like mob mobile-centric for for the mobile apps. Um, and then, like over time, actually they built out a lot of the analytics stack in-house, like replicated that whole event pipeline. Um, which I think at a certain scale makes a lot of sense. If you've got hundreds of millions of users and you've got millions of events and cross-platform and things like that, it, it can make sense to bring some of that stuff in-house. Same with the experimental framework. Um, but then, yeah, we also brought in more heavyweight tools on top, so we started to look more at uh, marketing automation. We brought in um, yeah, tools for that. Um, we got a proper attribution provider, which we didn't have in the early days. Um, so, yeah, basically like a slow maturation of both in-house and external tech. The more you, com you grow a company, obviously, your, or at least your goal should be to grow your revenues, right? And um, therefore, you will be able to hire more people to get more sophisticated and get more tools into your product, right? And um, therefore, of course, um, your uh, resources setup will change if it's tech or if it's people. It doesn't matter. Um, but um, 
you should ask yourself where, where am I now and what do I want to achieve the next, in the next iteration with my product. So talking about uh, someone just starting um, uh, in a completely fresh app with no users, it's probably the wrong choice to uh, think of implementing a CRM tool or something like that because there are just no users uh, which you can talk to, right? Um, but you would, what you want to understand is probably something like how is the in-app behavior of your first 1,000 users? What do they click? How long do they stay? When do they churn? And so on and so on. And there's probably a very simple choice where you go for some random analytics tool, which is for free uh, uh, out there, and uh, look into that data. And later on, the more uh, you grow, you probably plug in more and more things like an attribution provider or a BI tool um, to analyze uh, where is my marketing effectiveness coming from, uh, how is my retention uh, for different user cohorts. You probably uh, will need a marketing analyst who is preparing the data that you analyze and so on. So therefore, of course, uh, the bigger you get, the more your marketing setup will change. But as, uh, for example, Christoph from um, Lieferando mentioned in the morning, um, it's it's not necessarily means that you have to grow your marketing team to 100 people or something like that. Um, because you, of course, will lose, uh, lose efficiency in, in what you do. would certainly uh, want to back up that, that ID um, that you brought up of this, um, this whole process of setting up the text, and you as well, Andy, um, setting up the text and as kind of an um, iteration process. Um, and to give you a very physical example, maybe in terms of tracking, um, when you start off with your company and you don't have, like, five people just caring about your app tracking, um, then you'll, you'll most likely be fine with a solid tracking provider um, and a very basic concept that gives you the a good idea of you know, how your app works right now and what your users do. You probably won't need that fully fledged 40 plus event setup where you track every little step in the, in the flow and every parameter and everything that you might want to know at a later point. Um, the critical thing is that when you do that decision on, on day one, um, basically, where you would just start off, it has to be at least the provider has to be a scalable one. Like if you make the mistake to go with one that is not scalable or cannot do what you might want to do at a later point, then you're pretty screwed. But it's, I think, and, and also based on based on real world experience of clients, I think it, it's totally fine to start off with solid solid provider and then basically scale the setup, not the provider. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Now, I know as well that a few of you have worked across apps in different verticals. Did you see a change in the type of tech that you were using at different verticalized apps, so to speak? So for like a delivery hero, was it different than a dating app, different than a gaming app, so to speak? Um. Yeah, so for everyone in the audience, um, so my, my background is actually e-commerce, so I've worked at Delivery Hero, um, this online food delivery uh, platform here in Berlin, um, before we started our own company for three and a half years. Um, and to answer the question, I don't think that the point is so much in terms of on, on which tools to use per vertical, I think it's much more on the how to use the tool per vertical. Um, so for example, the gaming guys can all back this up in the audience here, Usually, and again, taking tracking as a physical example, usually they run on the same providers as maybe an e-commerce case or a mobility case, um, but they use a completely different setup of like completely different setup of the tool. They track different events, they save the data differently, they process it, they process it differently, they visualize it differently, um, and I think this is really the um, the key takeaway. Um, coming from that e-commerce background, seeing that it's most of most of the time it's the same set of tools, but in a very different use case. I just agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we all agree. <laughs> yeah. um, so have you guys ever had to build your own tools as well? And if you have, what pushed you there? Was it because there's like a shortcoming in the industry that they're not sort of ready made for you? Or is it just something that you wanted something more bespoke and you didn't want to spend money on the tool? I think that's a question for Andy because <laughs> you built something like that at SoundCloud, right? Yeah. Yeah, like at SoundCloud, we definitely built like plenty of in-house tech. Um, I think there's always a kind of a bias when a company is like very like engineering heavy, like to try to engineer everything them, like yourself. And and I, I I personally am not a big fan of that. I think reinventing the wheel when there are like perfectly good products out there um, and spending like valuable engineering resource building stuff which is not actually core to your business, but it's more like table stakes, um, I think it can be a huge distraction. Um, 
But I think like there are some cases where it can make sense. Um, like what you see also with typically also the bigger, like the huge platforms like, uh, like Facebook and Pinterest and these kind of folks out in SF, they, they often end up building out a lot of their own analytics stack. Um, I think quite often because of cost scaling, but also because if, you're, like, if you have touch points with users across a lot of different platforms, lots of different kind of, you've maybe got like an Apple Watch app, and you've got a mobile website, and you've got a desktop website, and you've got maybe a desktop app and also mobile apps, like to actually kind of like centrally track all of that information in one place, often it, it makes sense to sort of have your own data warehouse, and then you might end up building your own data pipeline as well. And then if you want to run A-B test experiments that are significant across all of those platforms and making sure that you're not in, not running experiments like across each other that we should invalidate them, it's often useful to in-house that as well, I think. What do you guys think is the biggest unsolved problem right now? I think it depends on the tool and exactly what you're needing. Like, for example, I'm working with App Store optimization, and there are many things lacking there still. I think they're working on it. I hope so. But basically, for any App Store optimization managers here, um, I guess you have the same problem that you have to manually every single time compare your uh, rankings. And actually, for example, you change your keywords on a frequent basis, um, and then you you just don't remember what you put the last time or the, the previous two times, and why did you change it? So you need to track those changes. And they're, for example, not enabled yet. Um, I heard that there's some new, uh, like some tools coming with new ideas, uh, but I think that, that there's many things lacking for ASO specifically, and I believe that their tools can do better in general in, in other ways. Yeah, I would also emphasize um, the problems that we have with apps optimization, that it's actually just a complete black box, apart from some assumptions that you draw and so on. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things um, the apps or providers actually should be able to, or sh should solve um, to enable us as advertisers to improve um, our presentation to users. Also, one, one other thing is, for example, um, the, the, the App Store looks the same wherever you bring a user in, from whatever uh, location in one particular country, uh, with whatever campaign, there are no landing pages or something like that. So that's definitely something what I totally miss as a marketer, that um, I can drive or run campaigns on Facebook which are dedicated to a very spe specific, uh, specific audience, and then the App Store should look like a landing page as it's use, uh, uh, used on, on regular desktop, right? Um, I think that would be of great benefit, actually. Um, just quickly to emphasize one big problem for Google Play is the A-B testing platform. So there is an A-B testing platform. Thank you, Google, for that. But what is this 90% accuracy? I mean, uh, there are so many A-B tests. There are so famous AA tests. There are so famous tests that actually fail, that have been proved that it's not true. And myself, I ran tests that are completely contradictory. And then uh, reaching out to Google and they're saying, uh, do it again. I said, well, but what about my two previous results? They're not accurate. So if they can fix that, if they, if they, they can really improve that, it will be amazing because we continue to emphasize the importance of A-B testing, but how do we justify it really with numbers? It's, it's, it's really a contradiction. All right. Now, <clears throat> bring up something completely different. Um, so for, for us being pretty um, deeply into how the attribution of installs actually works on the technical side, um, and one of our favorite topics, uh, issues that EdTech still needs to fix, um, is the way that Google, Facebook, and Twitter actually attribute their own installs, um, especially Facebook. Give a short summary, one or two sentences how they do it, um, or maybe how all the others do it. Um, so usual ad network publisher, um, basically from US marketing managers, gets a tracking link, um, puts tracking link behind a banner, um, and all the attribution, all the, uh, the fingerprinting on the click, all the matching is handled by Adjust. Um, so Facebook, let's take that example. How's that working? Uh, so Facebook has a direct connection to um, all the tracking providers, apart from Tune. <laughs> um, and um, what they do is basically, they go there and say, all right, we have this market position, so I want you guys, you as, as Edgers, as a tool, to send me all the installs in a stream that you see on your end, and then Facebook goes there and says, all right, that was, that was my install. I saw a click for that guy before. Um, and then it sends that beta deck back, and then Edgers has to uh, basically um, deal with it. Let's put it like this. Um, and this is one of the biggest, I think, in our, um, from my 
perspective, yeah. one Organic of the page, biggest things that, like that ad tech still needs to fix, objective attribution, um, which is there for everyone else apart from Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Yeah. Many problems. <laughs> what types of tools have you guys wanted to implement that might have caused controversy internally? So maybe your engineering team didn't want to yeah. implement something that you as marketers thought was really, really valuable for you. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> they always want to build it themselves, right? Oh, but um, yeah, no, I think um, you know, it, it really helps, I think, when you're working with, you know, uh, in, in an organization where you have different stakeholders and, and different requirements and also like, you know, competing, competing for resources and, and engineering time to do integrations and things like that. I think as a marketer, you have to be able to make a really good case for why you need tools. Um, you know, and, and, and I think it, it helps, like for me, that I came from a development background, that I'm able to sort of, you know, speak in, in the same language to developers. But um, yeah, I think I think marketers have to make a good effort to to understand the tech and to be able to kind of, you know, really explain the business benefits um, as well as you know, hopefully, yeah, understand maybe the listen to the developers if they're if they're pushing back on it that they you know try to understand the reasons why they, they think that this SDK is bloated or that it's going to cause crashes or things like that, and, and to try to have a bit of an open dialogue. But yeah, it's, there's always going to be like a healthy tension there, I think. So it's more about you briefing your developers with everything they absolutely should know in order to mitigate that? or Yeah, and I think also, like, you know, it's, if, you, if you're asking the developers to inter integrate a new SDK every week or every, every, every couple of weeks, it's... You, at some point, they're going to say, look, this, this, is, this has to stop. <laughs> that's, a um, that's, that's kind of fair yeah. enough, too, you know? Yeah, I think, um, again, completely, completely <laughs> agree with that. Um, so especially, I think, for, for guys like us that, you know, in the first place, make uh, money with talking. Um, <laughs> it's, it's one of the main challenges to actually get the developers on board for whatever they do. Um, good example of uh, what happens if developers do basically um, take their own decisions. Um, is Firebase Analytics. Not sure if any, any of you guys has heard of that before. Um, Google was super smart in, in basically um, marketing that as kind of a developer-friendly tool that can, does, that can do everything for free, um, that we see so many companies out there running on it now. Um, and then when the marketing guy comes around and basically wants to do something that is just ever so slightly more advanced, um, yeah, well, and not so much anymore. Um, so. Yeah, seconded. Um. Yeah, yeah, don't use Firebase. <laughs> yeah, it's actually um, under, in, yeah, underlining what I wanted to say, like uh, developers are not marketers, and they very often um, interpret or understand the tools that marketers re request <laughs> a complete, in a completely different way. To give an example, we just recently integrated a, a push notification tool, an SDK, just another SDK. For me as a marketer, everything was clear. I want to send something out, I want to uh, show uh, an in-app message, and um, I want to generate clicks and sign-ups. Um, but a developer just understood it as another analytics tool. So it's a complete misunderstanding. And then, of course, um, the developer quickly uh, put, integrates it in, in his understanding, let's say, and um, then it causes some errors or failures in the actual usage. So that it can be uh, complicated, and you often have to um, give a broader vision of how you actually want to use any tool um, so that the developer then understands um, what it's useful for as a marketer. So it's really about you doing planning beforehand to really understand what you want to get out of it to then brief that developer. It's not only about the planning, mm -hmm. it's actually really giving the story behind, like um, what, what I am supposed to do with it. Like showing, okay, de dear developer, I want to do this and show a user then that, and then this should happen, and so that he really gets the whole story mm -hmm. and um, what I want to analyze from that, for example. It's also maybe even a double trouble because uh, the product team comes along and says, like, I agree, you want to integrate that, but I have a new feature coming in, so I would like to integrate that as well. And in our in my current company, we have like dedicated teams for marketing and dedicated teams. Uh, like doing different uh, tasks. Uh, in my previous company, however, Dairy Games, we had to prioritize everything that comes from product and everything that comes from marketing. You can imagine that marketing was far behind in the pipeline, whatever we wanted to integrate. Uh, so it's also really this trouble, double struggle. First, the product, so they can agree. And then second, the developers, they say, this SDK will break the other SDK, I hate you. <laughs> we hope that doesn't happen. 
Thank you very much. We are meanwhile live on Facebook, so hello on Facebook. Thank you very much for uh, just for making that happen. That was Mobile Spray 2017. Thank you, Magda and Simon. Thank you to all the keynote speakers. That was really interesting, the insights that you shared with us throughout the day. Thank you to the tech team for the smooth transition. Yeah, they're already still working. And thank you. You've been a great audience. You asked the right questions, and you have not been falling asleep. Thank you very much. I hope to see you all on the party. The buses are outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.